They didn't just build a train line, they built a high-speed, deep-level, city-spanning tunnel system through the ancient, chaotic, and fragile underworld of London. It cuts through over 300 years of tangled infrastructure without breaking it, and it does this to move 200 million people a year. Welcome to the Crossrail Project, now known as the Elizabeth Line, the largest civil engineering job in all of Europe, costing around $17.7 billion. This mega-build redefined how we design, dig, and deliver transportation in old cities. So let's break down exactly how engineers made this possible. Let's start with the obvious challenge. London is full, above ground and below. Over 9 million people live here, and 31 million more visit every year. That means the roads, buses, and subways are packed. But it's underground where things get really tight. London's current underground system is over 150 years old, and it was never built to handle this kind of load. So engineers had one idea, go deeper. But how deep? Well, up to 40 meters below the surface, they carved out 42 kilometers of twin tunnels, each just over 6 meters wide, threading them directly beneath homes, banks, historical sites, sewers, power lines, and skyscraper foundations. To do this without causing sinkholes, cracks, or collapses, they turned to eight massive tunnel boring machines, each over 1,000 tons in weight and 100 meters long. These digging machines were custom-built for London's layered soil. Depending on the zone, engineers used either earth pressure balance machines or slurry TBMs. In the west, the soil is stiff London clay, perfect for earth pressure balance. These machines apply pressure at the front to balance the ground pushing back, so the tunnel face doesn't collapse. In the east, near the river, things get trickier. The soil becomes saturated and loose, so slurry TBMs were used. These add bentonite slurry, a thick, mud-like fluid, to stabilize the ground. The TBMs moved slowly, just about 100 meters per week, but behind the cutter head, each machine installed curved concrete segments, like slices of a ring, forming the tunnel lining. These segments lock together with precision, creating waterproof, load-bearing rings. There are over 250,000 of these lining segments in total. But the tunnel is only part of the story. The real magic happens in the stations. And Canary Wharf is a beast. This financial district is built on water, so engineers didn't build the station beside it. They went into the dock. The idea? Create a 250-meter-long station box inside the water. They started by constructing a gigantic coffer dam, a dry pit in the middle of a wet dock. First, they drove 18-meter-long tubular steel piles down into the dock bed to form the perimeter. But hammering steel near sensitive trading floors causes vibrations and noise, bad news in a financial hub. So they switched to silent piling, using a Japanese hydraulic machine called a Geekin that twisted and pressed the piles into the ground without vibration. No one nearby even noticed. Once the walls were in, they pumped out 98 million liters of water, equal to 40 Olympic swimming pools. Then they excavated 300,000 tons of material, digging down to solid ground 18 meters below water level. The result? A massive six-story structure four floors below water, a street-level promenade, and two more floors above. At full capacity, 24 trains per hour will pass through Canary Wharf, moving up to 68,000 people a day. And Canary Wharf is just one of 10 brand new stations. Others, like Whitechapel, Tottenham Court Road, and Liverpool Street, presented a different kind of challenge, extreme congestion. These stations had to be cut directly beneath historic neighborhoods, with buildings that were centuries old. And that's where engineering gets delicate. Because when you dig a big hole under a building, the soil shifts. And if you don't control that, walls crack, floors tilt, structures collapse. To prevent that, engineers used a technique called compensation grouting. Here's how it works. Above ground, they installed prisms, tiny glass sensors, on the walls of sensitive buildings. These reflect beams from a system called ATS, Automatic Theodolite System, which tracks position changes with pinpoint accuracy. If a building shifts even one millimeter, the system spots it instantly. Then engineers in underground grouting tunnels spring into action. Every three meters, there's an injection pipe that fans upward. They inject grout, a special liquid cement, through these pipes to stabilize the soil. The grout hardens below the surface, pushing the ground gently back up, literally lifting buildings by millimeters. Even huge 70,000-ton buildings were adjusted this way. This method saved countless structures across London, including Finsbury Circus, where listed buildings surround the tunnel zone. Without compensation grouting, the project would have been impossible. So the tunnels are carved, the ground is stable, but what about the space where the stations live? 
Tunnel boring machines are great for long straight runs, but when it comes to massive cathedral-sized spaces like platforms and ticket halls, you need different tools. Engineers used conventional excavators to dig out these large chambers. But here's the risk. If you leave exposed soil for too long, it collapses. So they sprayed it immediately with shotcrete. Shotcrete is a fast-setting concrete mix sprayed from a robotic arm at high pressure. But this isn't just cement. It's reinforced with tiny steel fibers that act like rebar on a microscopic level. This means it sets fast and holds strong. These robotic arms can spray up to 60 tons of shotcrete per hour, sealing the walls and making them safe for follow-up construction. It's a direct descendant of the original cement gun invented over 100 years ago, now evolved for high-stakes tunnel work. Once the stations and tunnels were shaped, engineers began the tunnel fit out. That's the phase where things start to look like a train line. They needed to install overhead power lines, signal cables, ventilation systems, lighting, firefighting systems, emergency exits, and drainage, all inside a narrow curved tube. To lay track, they used the MPG, the multi-purpose gantry. This beast of a machine lays 108-meter-long welded rails and drops 28 sleepers at a time with laser precision. They installed over 47 kilometers of track this way, pouring concrete around the sleepers to lock everything in. The result? A rock-solid base for high-speed electric trains. Speaking of trains, the Class 345 electric fleet is a new generation. Each train has nine carriages, stretches over 200 meters long, and runs up to 95 kilometers per hour. These are designed for high passenger flow, wide doors, and energy efficiency. Powering them is a 25 kilovolt AC overhead line system, standard for modern rail, but tough to install underground. Engineers had to ensure constant tension and clearance inside tight tunnels. And controlling all this, that's where the signaling comes in. Crossrail uses a blend of systems, CBTC, communications-based train control, in the central tunnel, ETCS, European Train Control System on the Heathrow branch, TPWS and AWS on the outer lines. Switching between systems in real time requires onboard software that's incredibly precise. Engineers spent years just testing and tuning this alone. Next, we'll continue with station accessibility systems, escalator construction, ventilation design, fireproofing, emergency protocols, testing, and the final phase of passenger integration. You've got the tunnels, you've got the stations, you've got the track, trains, and power. But without accessibility, all of that doesn't matter. And that brings us to one of the most overlooked but vital parts of the Elizabeth line, the vertical transport systems, escalators and lifts. Now most people think escalators are no big deal. You step on, you go up, you step off. But when the tunnel is 40 meters deep and you're moving hundreds of thousands of people daily, escalators become a serious engineering challenge. Crossrail includes 81 brand new escalators across its stations, the longest at Bond Street, 60 meters long weighing nearly 45 tons, just one meter shorter than the deepest escalator on the underground at Angel, and they weren't installed the normal way. At Whitechapel Station, for example, engineers couldn't dig down. There were too many buildings and streets above. So they did something wild. They dug up. Using a spider-like machine with hydraulic legs, engineers carved the escalator shaft upward, climbing at a steep 30-degree angle from the platform toward the street. Every scoop had to fight gravity. Every machine had to anchor itself to prevent slipping. No escalator tunnel in the UK had ever been dug this way before. It worked. Meanwhile, all central stations were built with full step-free access. That means elevators were installed that can take passengers from street level all the way to platform level without stairs. 54 brand new lifts were added. These aren't basic passenger lifts. They're built to handle wheelchairs, luggage, strollers, and in some cases, even evacuation stretchers. But going deep brings up another issue, air. At 30 to 40 meters below street level, ventilation is not optional, it's survival. Fresh air has to move in, heat, smoke, and dust have to move out. Crossrail's ventilation system is a series of giant shafts and fans, some of them six stories high, pushing and pulling air at massive volumes. If a fire breaks out, the system automatically switches to emergency mode, channeling smoke away from passengers and giving first responders a clear path. The tunnel walls themselves help with safety. Remember that shotcrete? It's not just for structure. Engineers added polypropylene fibers to the mix. This causes the concrete to char instead of exploding when exposed to intense heat. In case of a tunnel fire, this prevents walls from cracking or bursting under stress. Now let's talk about integration. 
The Elizabeth Line connects with existing lines, like the Great Western Main Line, the Great Eastern Main Line, and the Heathrow Branch. That meant linking the old with the new, with zero tolerance for error. At Old Oak Common, they built a dive under, a new rail flyover that lets slower freight trains pass under high-speed crossrail trains without delay. At Acton, a dive under allows the lines to intersect without disrupting each other. These split-level tracks are key to keeping traffic flowing at peak speeds. All of this, stations, tunnels, trains, track, had to be tested before the first passenger stepped on board. And the testing phase? It was brutal. First, systems had to be tested individually, electrical systems, air quality, fire suppression, lifts, signals. Then they had to be tested together. Crossrail entered trial running in 2021. That means full-size trains ran according to a real timetable, with no passengers, to simulate live conditions. Every movement was tracked, every second was measured, problems were fixed in real time. Then came trial operations, that's when staff began mock operations, like emergency drills, security checks, and station management, running it like the real thing without opening it to the public. In May 2022 the central section finally opened, Paddington to Abbey Wood. Then, in May 2023, the full route connected Reading and Heathrow in the west to Shenfield and Abbey Wood in the east. Crossrail officially became the Elizabeth Line. The trains? They're automated, but not driverless. Drivers control them, but the onboard computer manages speed, braking, and switching between signal systems. That way, trains can run safely at just 2.5-minute intervals, 24 trains per hour, moving people faster than ever. The tunnels are pressurized to reduce the whoosh of air pressure. The platforms have full-height screen doors, preventing people from falling onto the track and keeping tunnel air contained. And onboard Wi-Fi, air conditioning and wide doors give passengers a fast, comfortable ride. But even with all that, none of this would have worked without one final piece, logistics. Over 7 million tons of earth had to be removed from central London, and not dumped, but used. The excavated soil was shipped to Wallacea Island to create a new 650-hectare nature reserve. That's right, a train tunnel helped build wetlands for birds, fish, and marine life. Engineers moved over 110,000 lorry loads of spoil without choking city traffic. They also had to manage archaeology. Over 10,000 artifacts were found, spanning 55 million years of history, including Roman coins, Black Death victims, and Victorian chamber pots. Digging had to stop multiple times so archaeologists could excavate safely. Then there's cost. The original budget was £14.8 billion, but by the time it was done, Crossrail had cost £18.8 .8 billion. Some blame delays, some blame design changes, some blame politics. But in the end, the project still delivered one of the most complex rail systems ever built under a living city. Over 100 million work hours were logged. Thousands of engineers, architects, surveyors, and workers collaborated. Some of the world's best contractors, including BAM Nuttall, Keir, Ferrovial, Hockteef, and MTR, handled sections of construction, tunneling, and operations. And now, London has a new artery. The Elizabeth Line stretches from Reading and Heathrow in the west, through Paddington Tottenham Court Road, Liverpool Street and Canary Wharf, all the way to Shenfield and Abbey Wood in the east. It covers 118 kilometers with 41 stations, including 10 brand new underground ones. The tunnel alone, at 42 kilometers, is the longest new railway tunnel in Britain in over 100 years. What makes this project so revolutionary isn't just the trains, the tunnels, or the track. It's how every piece had to work together, in secret, under pressure, beneath a city that couldn't stop. That's the true power of engineering. And now that it's open, the Elizabeth Line is reshaping London in real time. Property values along the route are rising, businesses are shifting, new developments are popping up near stations that barely existed five years ago. The economic boost is expected to be in the tens of billions over the next few decades. And most importantly, it's setting the standard for how old cities can grow, by going under, not out. If you enjoyed this breakdown of one of the biggest engineering challenges in modern history, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, drop a comment with your favorite crossrail fact, and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next story. Thanks for watching.